Screw it, screw it, we're just just gonna gonna talk about Spider-Man. Welcome to Screw It, we're just gonna talk about Spider-Man. I'm one of your two hosts, Kevin Hines. And I am the other of your two hosts, my name's Will Hines. And this is the podcast where we talk about Spider-Man, and specifically we talk about the original Spider-Man comics by his creators, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. Uh, This is hopefully going to inspire people who have never read these old comics or who read them a long time ago. It'll inspire them to reread them. And for some people, it's just a a peek at where he started, this character that people have learned to love in the movies and the cartoons and the current comics are now learning uh, basically his childhood, the character's childhood. Uh, Yes, Kevin and I um, uh, are brothers and we are performers at the Upright Citizens Brigade uh, Improv slash Sketch Theater. and we're huge fans of Spider-Man, and, and we were big fans of him as kids. And we, and we read most of these issues when we were kids, so we've kind of grown up with them. And so we're ex- uh, those are really our only qualifications. In other words, we have yeah. no official qualifications. Right. I mean, we've read these comics numerous to- a lot of them numerous times. Yeah. I and mean, the ones we're so, covering today, I, uh, I must have read 30, 40 times. Yeah, we're going over... Last episode, this episode, and next episode, we're going over three of my all-time favorite comic books and one of my favorite stories of any medium. So I'm so excited that we're that we're on the issues that we're on. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully for people who haven't read these or, or have always wanted to read these, this podcast is helping. And we're definitely getting uh, emails and responses on Twitter and Instagram that sort of imply that that is happening. Uh, and that, I think that's great. I meet a lot I of people it. who say like, oh, I just read... You know, the latest issue that you talked about. And I'm like, oh, that, that's great. Yeah. And I often ask, like, what do you think of the ones that follow? And they're like, oh, I'm waiting for your episode of the podcast. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Exciting. Um, but that's really great. I think that's really fun. Yeah, so gratifying. Um, so this episode, we're going to go over Amazing Spider-Man issue number 32. Ugh. This is the second. Too it's too good. It's too good. It's almost so good we shouldn't talk about it. And we almost should skip this episode. We almost, nobody should read it. It's like that good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, um, this is part two of what we're calling the Master Planner trilogy. I think a lot of people probably call it that. Yeah, so I call it the Master Planner saga. Is that crazy? I don't think so. Okay. And um, I mean, you're asking yeah, and, and, one person who's going to for sure agree with you. Yeah, right. right. I think and and the, the Master Planner... Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Master Planner trilogy is one of the all-time great Spider-Man stories as any... Any fan of the series will agree. This is one of those stories where it's not a question of whether you think it's good. You only argue about how good it is. Like, is it the absolute best Spider-Man story or is it merely in the top five greatest Spider-Man stories ever? It's it's that kind of discussion. Yeah. And uh, last uh, week we talked about issue 31, which was a lot of just setup. Yeah. I I think it was really, really good. We had some debate over whether or not people would have liked it without having read the whole trilogy. Yeah. but, uh, you know, the setup is in place and things really ramp up Kick in here. I mean, and this ends just, oh, it, it ends so great. I mean, it's this, this might be the single best issue, even though next issue has the most famous sequence in the I, story. I thought about that as I finished this issue, that is this issue better than 33? And I don't think it is. There's so much yeah. I love about 33. Well, but the fact so that many it's close th- is crazy. Yes. Uh, oh, there's the finish of a story is so emotionally powerful that it's very difficult for the middle chapter to be like such a peak, but I don't, man, this is just, what a great issue of Spider-Man. I mean, just Ditko and Steve Ditko is doing this almost totally by himself. Although Stanley's dialogue, I think is exceptionally great, but um, Ditko is, I think he's at the peak of his whole career. I mean, I think we're seeing his greatest accomplishment in comics. I yeah. Think. I mean, also at this point, he wasn't super, uh, objectivist, right? He's getting into that, but I don't think he is. The objectivist stuff? Yeah. You're talking about the Ayn Rand theory stuff that yeah, Steve Ditko... Yeah, that sort of, like, takes over so, his career. Yeah, so, yeah, just so listeners, what St- Steve Ditko, who is the artist, was also uh, doing the stories, uh, coming up with the stories and plotting them. Uh, Stan Lee, the credited writer, was really only doing the dialogue at this point. Um, and Steve Ditko almost uh, famously over the course of his career gets very into the philosophies of Ayn Rand who wrote the Fountainhead book and Atlas Shrugged and Steve Ditko would get so into her philosophies that it would totally take over his comics for a while and there certainly are seeds of it more more than seeds of it 
in, in Spider-Man stories, but it's still very much in the background. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely things in here that I think go against what he believes where that is not true. in like the question and for sure not true in his, uh, self-published stuff like Mr. A, of course. Right. Um, yeah, this is still a more, uh, generic action story as opposed to something that's trying to teach a philosophical lesson. Yeah. This is entertainment first, I, yeah. I think. And I think that helps it sort of be peak Ditko. It's like he's as good as he's ever going to be without letting that stuff sort of disrupt his storytelling. Yeah, it's one of the masters of the form who is using all of his skills to bring you a terrific action story. It's And it's got emotional undercurrents and it's paced so well and it's leveraging so much that has been built over the course of this series. I mean, I'm just, I'm so excited. I can't, I'm so excited we're doing this. Yeah, I reread this recently because uh, Steve Ditko passed away in July. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, end of June. End of June. End of June. And we kind of found out about it, I guess, beginning of July. Yep, that's right. And I reread these three issues then sort of to Me honor too. him. Me too. Um, and I hadn't read, read them at that point for a few years. Yes. Um, but then I reread it again earlier tonight. Uh-huh. And I was still like hit hard, but I was like, ooh, this it's, is good. Me too. Me too. I got so excited. I mean, it's just, it's so incredible to me uh, how ahead of its time it was. It just raises the bar. I mean, it must have just. Uh, there are movies I like mean, this and there are TV shows and there's books like this for sure. I mean, there's lots of things like this where I would, I'll watch the movie and then go see the movie again shortly thereafter. And it's still just as good. It's still just um, as good. But yeah. often even good movies, it's like, ah, didn't, you know, it loses something because I just saw it recently. But yep. the great movies don't do that. And the great television shows and the great books, it's like you could read them right after you finished reading them and still be like, oh, still love it. And this is yeah. one of those for me. I feel like I could read it 10 times in a row, these three issues, and still be like, yeah, love it. I do have one critique about it, which we'll get into when we get into the story. Ooh, I'm, excited. I'm excited to hear that. Hot take. Hot yeah. take. Um, okay, well, let's let's get into it. So we start with the cover. Uh, I should say this is also the first issue for the 1965, or we are six, six. 1966 now. So this is January yeah. 1966 was the first Spider-Man comic of the new year. What a crazy year! The Master Planner Saga and also Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Caban comes out this year. You know? Yeah, I mean, one of those things sort of affected everyone in the world, and the other one was sort of a music record <laughs> that some people, you know. That's sort of a light <laughs> thing that, you know, uh, frivolous, I guess, fun is what I would call it. <laughs> right? That's yeah. what people would call the Beatles albums. Yeah, the Beatles, not, not impactful surface level pop music band. Yeah, yeah. Underachievers, I think, is the yeah, adjective okay. I usually hear but, associated with but Beatles. Marvel Comics from the 1966. This is something that everyone in their bones knows now. <laughs> well, you know, and all sarcasm aside, I if if you are interested in reading or writing superhero comics. If you're a kid who loves superhero comics in the sixties and you're going to grow up to be somebody who makes them, you know, if you are Jim shooter, Christopher priest or whatever, you got to read this and be like, Oh, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to do something this good. I'm sure. Sure. This is one of the stories that inspired people. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Uh, so great. let's get to the cover cover. So, and it's a good, good cover. cover. Uh, the name of this chapter is called man on a rampage. It is a, it is Spider-Man who shows him ripping a metal staircase off of some structure while there's people on it. He's knocked over a car. It just shows him going to town with a little inset of Aunt, a sick Aunt May. And the caption is, with his Aunt May gravely ill in the hospital, Spider-Man fights as never before. And that is a good description of what we've got inside. Yeah, and I will say this cover, like him ripping the staircase, uh, does seem more powerful than he's ever seemed to before. Like we've definitely seen him do some very strong, physically impressive things, but this cover eight looks like, Ooh, he could do this. He's also putting people in danger, right? Like there's people on the stairs and he's just kind of recklessly tearing this thing apart with them on it. I mean, he they're, looks like they're, a they're criminals and they deserve it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That might, well, I don't know why I agreed so quickly. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally getting sucked they in. They can't be redeemed. <laughs> um, it lives up to its title, and uh, what yeah. a, what a great drawing! Um, and this was the same cover, I believe, was on the Marvel Tales reprint that we had. I'm yeah, Marvel sure. Tales. No, that's that's true. Marvel Tales, which used to reprint the Spider Man stories, and when we were kids, like in the early eighties, this is like eighty three, eighty four, um, Marvel Tales every month would reprint an old Spider Man story, and that's how I first and you first read 
the Master Planner trilogy. And uh, yeah, Marvel Tales used these covers on the reprints. So which yeah. they didn't always. Sometimes they, they had didn't always do it. Yeah. New drawings or, or alternate covers. But these three, I, I I I feel like I knew these covers before I saw them uh, in collections. Um, the so let's let's should we just dive into the issue here? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, we go into the splash page. Uh, and a, a lot of splash pages are sort of like alternate covers, but in this case, we are we are beginning the story, and it is showing the underground, oh, sorry, the underwater layer of the villain who is called the Master Planner. We're about to find out a secret identity, but as of this panel, we don't know. Um, yeah, and he has sort of been plaguing Spider Man, definitely all of last issue, and a little bit even the issue before that, yep. with well planned crimes that Spider Man often can't stop, or he can uh, at best slow down. Yeah, so yeah, there's these really adept criminals afoot, and this is the lair of the of the person running the show. I want to say oh, I gotta pause. Sorry, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I won't beep anymore. Great. I know, get my headphones back on. Do we want to just go back a couple lines? I, I can just pick it up. You ready? Yeah, you're a pro. <laughs> um, before we get more into the story, I want to say. Although this is Steve Ditko's masterpiece and he is doing the majority of the work here, Stanley is still awesome. He, uh, he he's doing the dialogue and um and he's he's bringing out a lot of the character of all the people. Uh, he brings out the personality of all the characters. He lays on the drama really well. Um, he is an excellent wordsmith, I think, and there's a great p- phrases that I'm going to point out when we get to them. And on this splash page, I mean, we have the requisite Stanley super wordy sales pitch telling us how good the story is that we're about to read. But I have to say, since it's leading into one of the great all time stories, it works. Yeah, I had some question in the last issue of whether or not Stanley was sort of selling up a story that he found underwhelming or if he could tell it was building to something really good. Uh, But this issue, I think he now knows for sure. Oh, this is good. Yeah. And I love it. And I want to sell this one because I think this is, this is it. Yep. Um, Even like the little credits box, which has been, had a lot of jokes. The jokes are kind of being muted. Like Stan is sort of like kind of all business on this issue. Yeah. Now the, the uh, I mean, he gives Artie Samak a little yeah. uh, nudge with calling a, a kibitz yeah, thing. The, the credit is one of his script credits. and editing by Stan Lee, plot and illustration by Steve Ditko, lettering and kibitzing by Artie Simic. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty minimal jokes for the Stan Lee credit box. I also want to say, yeah, there's really no. That's the only joke in this entire cover. Yeah, and I want to say, um, these are the credits that a lot of the early Marvels, I think, should have. Script and editing by Stan Lee, plot and illustration by the other person. I think that's a the most accurate breakdown of the collaboration that I've seen. Yeah, no matter how much they talked before the story was written, I don't care if we're talking about Don Heck or Jack Kirby, uh, and for sure Steve Ditko, the artists were all plotting these stories. Yep. And also, but I also like that Stan's getting clean because I do think he is a masterful editor, and it's when these guys would leave Marvel and do stuff without Stan, they needed an editor. They would put too many ideas or too much of something or other. Like, you know. Yeah, and pacing yeah. and some of that stuff would get worse. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I love that. Um, okay, so let's go to page one. Page one, we learn who the master planner is. Kevin, who's the master yeah, planner? Yeah, and, and, and the master planner is none other than Spider-Man. I would say at this point, his arch nemesis. Yep. Dr. Octopus. Dr. Octopus. Yeah, the one of his big villains and who and who has been the villain for all of the great Spider-Man stories. So somehow Steve Ditko is great with the Doc Ock story. Yeah, I mean, uh, Doc Ock was his first real challenge. He uh, made Spider-Man consider quitting because like, oh, I can't beat this yeah, guy. Was back in issue three. Uh, Doc Ock has unmasked Spider-Man. Yep. But so easily that he assumed it wasn't the real Spider-Man. Yeah, a very cool story. He led the Sinister Six. Uh, and he charmed Aunt May. Yeah, Aunt May was wooed by him in that moment. <laughs> uh, he uh, kidnapped uh, Betty Brandt. I guess that was also part of the unmasking. Yep. Uh, but he, you know, killed, uh, basically led to the death of Betty Brandt's brother. Which made Betty Brandt swear she would never be in love with Spider-Man. Yeah. And is that it? Is that all the Doc Ock stories yeah, we've I think had? That's, I think that's right. 
So it's not a lot. And it has been a while since we've seen Dr. Octopus. And we've had a lot of Green Goblin lately. So it's nice that he's back to sort of say, hey, don't forget about me. Um, so this first page. Uh, and oh. I'd also like to say, I think this is my one criticism of this story. Okay. Is that I wonder if it would have hit better if we didn't see Doc Ock until Spider-Man saw Dr. Octopus. Right. Uh, next issue. When we get to yeah. when we get to the very end of this oh, very, issue, yes. Spider Man sees Doctor Octopus. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to posit this question: How cool would have that page been? I think if that's where we. I learned? think you're right. Uh, I wonder if that's. I think it'd be better. I wonder if that's just Steve Ditko though thinking I got to show the readers that one of the big familiar villains is part of the story, and I want to do it early. Yeah, I mean it's not a hor- I mean it, the story works. Yeah, but there's something so cool about what Spider Man realizes who's been behind this that we can't feel quite as much. And so much of what makes Spider-Man great is that you can relate to him. Yeah, Kevin? We lose a tiny bit of that in that moment. I think you might be right. I think you might be right. And better than Steve Ditko in a lot of ways. (laughs) You're better at comics than Steve Ditko. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people say that. And I don't know if it's true, but it's probably true. Probably true. Um, But anyway, so we're seeing Doc Ock, and he's now revealed as a master planner, and he is talking about how he's been stealing all this radioactive material. He says how radiation gave him his powers and that, and he was a doctor of radiation or whatever the heck his secret identity was. And so yeah. he's trying to increase his power over radiation and he's like accumulate uh, the robberies that we've seen. And we saw him steal uranium last issue or the issue before uh, ha- have been to, to help like help him do these experiments that he's doing. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what his plan is. We never really learn. It doesn't matter. We don't know what the master planner's plan is, but we know it involves radiation experiments. Yeah. Kind of Marvel, Marvel sixties comics are a lot, a lot about bags of money and radiation, turning people into super creatures. (laughs) He tells one of his soldiers on this page, uh, continue to search for any and all atomic equipment for me. And the guy should be like, no problem. It's New York. This place is crawling. (laughs) And this is Marvel comics, New York city. There's an atomic research center on every block. (laughs) Um, at the bottom of the first page, we go to some of our, our first Peter Parker subplot, and Steve Ditko is great at the emotional Peter Parker subplot, and it's Betty Brant who's been proposed to by Ned Leeds, and Peter is kind of heartbroken because he knows he can't win her back because she hates Spider-Man. Yeah, and his only real chance to win her back would be to like reveal his secret that she knows he's keeping. She knows he's keeping something from her, Yeah, but what he would reveal would end up ending their relationship anyway, so he's just trying to move on but betty you know and this is good of her wants to talk to peter before she accepts the proposal from ned leeds i mean she's still in love with peter and she's yes. in a way just not ready to let go of him so peter page two and also ned leeds is far too old <laughs> as we've said before ned leeds has got to be like 29 and we think betty is at oldest 19 so this dude's a, he's a creepazoid at, at best he's 10 years older and i mean honestly uh, though someone I I brought this theory up to somebody recently and they're like, sounds like J. Jonah Jameson maybe just hires a bunch of kids. <laughs> yeah. Jameson might be the real creep. Um Yeah. <laughs> so there's the only way Ned Leeds isn't a creep is that Jonah has hired some eighteen year old to be his European correspondent for his newspaper. Yeah, which that that does that does seem consistent with his hiring practices. Um one thing I think is interesting on page two is so Peter wants to a clean break. He's tortured but he wants to break it off with Betty completely because he knows there's no hope. So his his strategy is to act like a complete jerk and to sort of like be really rude and bullying to Ned and kind of very short and mean to Betty in his tone, right? Yeah. That's his plan. And although that plan is stupid, um, I do I do it does seem like the kind of stupidity that a young man does especially a, a a male teenager you know like the acting out um it, yeah especially a male teenager in his first relationship yep uh, going through huge stress as his never like, really even been had a woman interested in him before yeah betty's his he doesn't know how to act in this scenario it's something that uncle ben would have helped him with that's right and so uh, and it kind of dovetails nicely. Like we're going to see Spider-Man go off in anger later in the story. So now we see this anger in Peter. It's kind of a cool little parallel. Yeah. I mean, Peter shoves Ned Leeds. Hard. We got a big old thump. Yeah. And he knocks some books 
over in J. Jonah Jameson's office and J. Jonah Jameson's even shocked because Peter's never seemed like the violent type to him. Parker, I never thought of you as the violent type. What are you doing here anyway? Um, J- Jameson is uh, sporting some nice pants, I want to say here. I like, I like J. Jonah Jameson's pants in panel six. Okay. <laughs> That's fair to say, I guess. <laughs> um, so Jameson asks Peter for photos. Peter's really hurting for cash. Aunt May's in the hospital. She's dying. Uh, and, but there's been no crime in the city except for the master planner stuff, which goes, I guess, goes so smoothly that it's unphotographable, I suppose. Yeah. So, he, he has to, Spider-Man has to leap into a battle too quickly to set up his camera and um, hasn't gotten any photos. He has no good pictures. So Jameson won't buy any of these photos, doesn't give him money. So Peter's broke as usual. Um, top of page, interesting. Betty sees through. Technically, technically top of page four. Page one was the splash, splash page, page, right? Top of page four. Okay, right. So page two is Doc Ock. Page three is Peter being a jerk to Ned. Page, That's right. page four is Betty. Betty, this is a real uh, top of your intelligence move here. Betty sees through Peter's anger as an act. Yeah. Uh, I like when Betty's smart. Me too. Um, I like when anybody in these Marvel comics is like smarter than I expect. And um, she's like, you know, don't do this. I know you're putting up a front. Tell me what's going on. And he won't do it. It's a real big soap opera. Panel three of page four. He's just walking off, leaving her. And this is going to be it, right? Like he and Betty are over, I think. Yeah, we're almost to the end of that. I mean, Gwen Stacy's not in this issue. She's being set up as his next girlfriend by the gods that write these comics. Yeah. Um, and she's not in this issue, but we're definitely, we're, we're rocketing towards the end of Betty Brandt. Yeah. Which I'm not a hundred percent sure if that does happen in these, in Ditko's era, if it happens just after, uh, where they officially, officially, officially say that's it. Yeah. But it's close. It's close. Uh, now, now bottom of page four, one of the big reveals, and I guess, if I'm in a cynical mood, I can say this is a ridiculous story point, but uh, it worked on me. I can't, I can't, I can't complain about it because it totally. I don't, I don't agree with whatever you're saying. I think this is all good. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's get into it. Where Peter goes to the hospital where Aunt May is like on death's door and the doctor has a, a terrible, terrible piece of news for Peter. Yeah. They've discovered a radiation, radioactive material in her bloodstream. And Peter remembers that. It's when he gave her a blood transfusion sometime in the teens. The issue, no, issue 10, right before he faced off against his arch nemesis, the enforcers. Uh, okay. He gave I her a blood transfusion. Yeah. And it's, the, it's really the enforcers are really the ones that <laughs> caused this to happen. And they have proven, Fancy Dan has proven himself to be Spider Man's master. I was going to say the only thing missing from this great story is there's no enforcers. And now I know that they are indirectly connected and that, that that is the final piece of the puzzle. Um, so the tragedy here is Peter Parker has introduced the radiation that's killing his aunt May. He would be responsible for killing her. Yeah. He put, she wouldn't, I mean, he gave her blood transfusion to save her life, but also it's now going to kill her. Yeah. And it's a kind of a good little dramatic thing. Peter Parker in the very first Spider-Man story ever causes the death of his uncle Ben through inaction by refusing to catch a criminal. That is the guilt that drove him to be the greatest superhero ever. And now he's discovering that he's maybe also going to kill his aunt, you know, accidentally. And when he first got these powers, the only two people he wanted to take care of, he said, everyone else can go rot except for aunt May and uncle Ben. And right now he's going to lose the second of those two people. Yeah. So the stakes are as high as you can get in a Spider-Man story. Not only I mean, is that man on death's door. Specifically, sorry, go ahead. Not only is that man on death's door, it's his fault. Yeah. And then the first panel of page five even says, I've always felt I was partly responsible for the death of Uncle Ben because he was killed by a criminal whom I didn't catch. And now Aunt May. And I, and I just want to say that this is where Lee and um, Ditko just they work together well even if they don't talk even if ditko even if ditko annoys lee or whatever or or something or lee doesn't or lee thinks that ditko's full of himself or whatever was going on we we don't know what the story is um like lee is so good at minding what the reader knows and what the reader doesn't know of taking care of where the dramatic moments are oh this page is so good i mean it's peter at home just like racked with guilt and anger 
he smashes apart a desk in a middle panel. I mean, the lamps go flying. I mean, he shatters basically one of Aunt May's prize pieces of furniture in rage. We get her, going all to this dialogue. Aunt May's death. Yes, all this dialogue. I love it so much. The two people I've loved most in the world who were like my own mother and father to me, yet their love for me, their kindness to me has brought them nothing but tragedy. But it can't happen again. It mustn't. It mustn't. Smashes that desk. Not to Aunt May. She's been too good, too kind. I can't pay her back like this. And now we are setting into motion the man on a rampage thing, right? He's just – yes. 1000% devoted to saving her life. Yeah. He just, he's like, this is all I need to figure out how to do this. I'm going to find a solution. I'm going to work towards it. Nothing's going to slow me down or stop me. Nothing else matters. Like this, we know, we know this is true from previous issues of Spider-Man. Aunt May is the trump card. And his first thought is like, I know who can help me save Aunt May. Dr. Kurt Connors, the lizard Mm -hmm. is a biologist who I saved. Yeah. So, this is where like we're starting to leverage all of the other previous great stories. His compassion to Dr. Connors is going to pay he off. He could have sent to jail. Yep. But he didn't. Uh, so that's going to, that's yeah. going to save his butt right here. He finds Connors has moved to New York convenient for the story. Spidey swings as, as Spider-Man, Peter swings over to the hospital, gets a sample of Aunt May's blood, swings over to Dr. Connors lab and says, here's her blood, you know, figure out a way to save this. Well, first he goes, do you remember me? Which is a very funny thing <laughs> like, to say. To this of course, person. He, Connors is like, how could I ever forget you? I'm like, yeah, that's great. And he goes, without your aid, I'd still be a creature of the swamps, feared and hunted by my fellow man. <laughs> that, that's true. That's an insane exchange. I blew yeah. right by that. Do you yes. remember me? Do you remember me? As he's swinging into a window. <laughs> Like, uh, the face is familiar, but I'm not. Give me a hint. Give me a hint. But uh, do we go to school together? <laughs> like, yeah. No, we we fought in the swamps of Florida, and I forced you to drink a, an antidote to your po- your potions. That's right. Um, but, that, but that's yeah. kind of cool because he, this is a dude who is just as motivated as Spidey to help, right? Like, yeah, he he owes Spider Man everything, and he would probably drop anything. But he's, I don't know what he's working on now, but he's going to drop it all I mean, he's, to help he, Spider-Man save Aunt May. He's got the requisite Ditko beakers and tubes. Yeah, I mean, this lab it gets even greater a little bit later in the story, know, but it's a cool I, I lab. Can't wait, I can't wait. So um, Spidey's like, I can't tell you who this is, but this blood belongs to someone who's a friend of mine, and I need you to try to save. And so Connor's like, all right, I'll look into it, and I know that I need a certain chemical called ISO 36. Yeah, MacGuffin 36. MacGuffin 36. Uh, So, you know, Connors is like, that's what you got to find, Spider-Man. So, you know. So Spider-Man says, I don't care what the cost is, order some. And he goes and sells all of his belongings. Yeah, he sells all of the science equipment, which we know that he dearly loves. I mean, this is just paying off everything we've seen for so many issues. He goes to the pawn shop. Uh, He's he's given up. Nothing he has matters. Uh, This is all about saving Aunt May. Yeah, this is all of his money. Yep, he takes everything out of the bank. He hawks everything. We know he can't sell any photos to Jameson right now. Gets to Connor's lab with this big fistful of money. Connor has ordered the MacGuffin 36. And then these panels are awesome on page yeah. seven. These are the most ditko y things in like the whole issue. Yeah, for Where, sort of no reason at all, Spider Man just starts mixing chemicals. Spidey's like, the, I know you I know you have to do a lot of preparation, so I'll just start pouring a bunch of shit into these beakers. Yeah, it's sort of showing that Spider-Man is also a scientist, unbeknownst to Kurt Connors. But it's just it's it's like slow down, Tex. Yeah, he just dives. He's like he's like with two hands, like pull, he's pulling a switch with his left hand, pouring a test tube with his right hand. Smoke's going everywhere. I mean, he looks insane. Yeah, and Kurt's not doing much. Kurt's just watching. I suspect <laughs> you're not a full time Spider-Man. The bottom of page seven, those two panels are just like those are the most Ditko-y things, you know? Yeah, super articulated hands, billowing smoke. So funny. Tubes running all over. <laughs> yeah. What Kirby did for dots and machines, Ditko does for lab equipment and smoke. Yeah, cords and smoke. Yeah. Okay, so uh, page eight. Meanwhile, um, Dr. Octopus has also heard about MacGuffin 36, and he wants it for his crazy whatever. Yeah, so he sends his uh, master planner crew to steal it. And as we've seen, they always get the job done, and they get the job done here. They steal MacGuffin yeah. 36 as it's being delivered from the airport. Their plan here was to knock the guy in the back of the head and grab it. And, and it, it worked. worked. And it worked great. Um, meanwhile, back in Dr. Connor's lab, Connor gets word right away that the MacGuffin 36 is, has been stolen 
And so he can't continue with his work on the cure. Yeah. The master planners gang has stolen ISO 36 and Spider-Man. This is the you know crime uh, that's been going on. That's sort of been bothering him and he hasn't been able to stop them. And now he hears they got the one thing he needs to save his Aunt May's life. And so we know how motivated he is. Like, yeah, this is what makes the story so great. It's been 30, whatever issues of guilt, of responsibility, of having to hold back, of balancing, juggling everything about your life. But now he is single minded. And Spider-Man just, he just needed like, what can I do to save Aunt May? I need to do something. I don't want to just stand around. It's like, oh, this person has a serum. Great. I'm going to go beat the crap out of him. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Now I have something that I can take this out on. Yes, which is something else that we've seen. He he needs he can't just like sit around when when uh, his personal life goes crazy. Um, so he's looking for Frederick Foswell, who f- former head of the mob, current yep. reporter for the Daily Bugle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So he goes to the Bugle, but this is kind of a cool story thing because that means he runs into Betty, who's he's scared ha- of him, and she's terrified of him. Spider Man comes in, and not only is she scared, she's scared and she despises him. Yeah, we've had a few issues. For a while, where it seemed like she was sort of supporting Spider-Man and didn't seem to hate him that much, uh, which sort of fell out of touch with the way her character has been. But this is right back in line with where she's been since her brother died. She's just like, this guy's bad. This guy. He's bad news. I love it. I I love the more soap opera-y Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Spider-Man gets, the more I love it. So I I like Betty's look on the fourth panel of page nine. It's such a good one. Great. It's such a good, and then Spidey's, it's melodramatic, but I love this dialogue. When I see her that way, so fragile, so helpless, how I long to take her in my arms. I, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's a little too much, but it works. Yeah. And then we see him like swooping down through the street. Just oh, What a great Foswell. dog. Just grabs Foswell, who's just like walking down the street, like popping into Macy's or something to buy a new tie. And Spider-Man swoops down, grabs him and says, go limp. I got you. Um. Panel six, Foswell's actually looking pretty chill for having been swooped up into the air. Uh, he says, Spider-Man in broad daylight. Uh, kind of reminding us that Spidey is beginning to act super recklessly. Yeah. And this doesn't really pay off anywhere, I don't think. Um, maybe it does in the next issue, but I don't think it does, if I, uh, if I remember correctly. He basically threatens Foswell to, to figure out where the master planner is. He says... I can be a good friend or a bad enemy. The choice is yours. Yeah. He really lays into him. Like he, he is more intense than we've ever seen him. Uh, And then the bottom of page 10, we see, or or right. He says, okay. He thinks to himself, I'm not going to twiddle my thumbs waiting for Foswell to learn something. And now he goes on a little tour of the New York underworld, just beating the crap out of everybody to learn something about the master planner. Yeah. He's like kicking doors down, smashing every piece of furniture and just like, doesn't even wait for people to answer him necessarily, just knocking people out saying, where's the master planner? And they're all like, we don't know. Don't hurt he's us. Scaring the crap out of everybody. Like he's always been holding back especially with regular people. And now he's not. Yeah. We have a 11 where the doctors are basically like Aunt May's a goner. She's dying. Um, then we cut back to Spidey and then we get to the sequence where that the cover is from, where he's in some sort of underground garage and he's like just flipping cars, ripping a staircase off as people try to scramble away from him. Yeah. People are running up a staircase to get away from him. So he just pulls the staircase down, yeah. which uh, stops them from getting away. And they're pulling guns on him and it, he doesn't even pause. He's like, he's just, he's annoyed that they're pointing guns at him. He's yeah. like, you drop those guns for, I really get mad. I'm through treating you punks with kid gloves. And you could sort of imagine him like, this is like Dark Knight Returns level crazy. You could imagine him like shattering somebody's leg to prove a point right now. It's also important to remember he's 18. Yeah. It's he's a kid. Terrifying to think of an 18 year old with this much power and this much rage. Yeah, think uh, about think about your know, the emotional maturity you have when you're 17 or 18. Now imagine like the person you love most in the world is dying, and you might have done it. And there's these people that are criminals that, uh, in your mind, maybe somewhat deserve it, are in your way. W- what do you do? I mean, like it's it's uh, yeah, it is a great, it is such a great conceit for the for a superhero story. Oh man, it's so, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Every punch he throws, you can imagine as the reader just being filled with near uncontrollable rage. It's weirdly satisfying to see your hero kind of let loose. And for a city that's sort of already kind of scared of him, 
this is also great in the sense that like you can imagine like for now for years later when people are like, oh, Spider-Man's a good guy. The people are like, I don't know. He, he like goes nuts shattered sometimes. people's faces. <laughs> yeah. And they might be criminals, but I mean, that guy goes too far. And they, uh, they have a point. They have a point. I mean, this is the, you know, these vigilantes with powers can be out of control. And this is one of those times. Uh, we cut back to Connors. Connors like, I can't do anything without MacGuffin 36. Um, we cut back to Spidey. Everybody's doesn't, has been coming up empty for him. But then he finds a secret passage underneath um, basically some old alley or something. And it opens up onto like a big warehouse filled with the master planners gang. He stumbled on them. Um, so he knows he's hit pay dirt. He's found the master planners hideout. And uh, he's immediately just surrounded by like 10 dudes. He but dives into them. He dives into them and they, he just overwhelms all of them instantly. Uh, not instantly, but he just starts going to town on these guys. Yeah. He's just pounding them and tossing them aside. And he sees them coming through like a hidden door and he dives through that hidden door, which seems to be maybe part of their plan. This might be a master plan. <laughs> That's right. But I like everybody's commenting that Spidey seems like on another level, you know? Yes. Um, like these, these guys even comment, he, we need help. He's too strong, too fast. What will we do? Um, Spidey notices that reinforcements are coming out of a certain elevator shaft. So he dives into that. He wants to go deeper into the bees hive here. Right. And that's when we cut the doc, Ock, who's, who's happy that Spider-Man is going into this shaft. He says, good. I couldn't have planned it better if I tried. Yeah. One stroke of blind luck has given me the chance to dispose of Spider-Man forever. So he has the MacGuffin 36 and he, yeah, he doesn't know why Spider-Man wants to see him, but he knows Spider-Man does. So he's like, great. I've got bait to bring my, my hated enemy to me. Perfect. I can take this guy easy. Yep. And he has beaten him most of the time that he's faced him. Yes. Uh, most of the one-on-one -on -one fights, I mean. And um, he sets up the serum with a little spotlight on it, and Spidey comes crawling after it. His spider sense is going, but he, he can't stop. He needs this chemical. And he knows it's, it looks like a trap, but he has to get it. And so he's crawling along the ceiling, and it's electrified. He gets shocked and he falls off the ceiling. And Dr. Octopus grabs him. It's the bottom of page 15. It's one of the great pictures in this series of Doc Ock just like clinging to Spidey. And this is where Spidey learns the master planner is Dr. Octopus. And Kevin, I think you're right. This would have been a stronger reveal if we didn't know also until yeah, now. Yeah, this was the moment. You might have needed like another line of dialogue or some panel of the door starting to open. You know, it's like here comes the master planner or something like that. And then out comes Doc Ock. It'd be like, whoa. Yeah. Um, so then we get into have, it. I think it would have knocked my socks off. Uh, I, I think you're right. I totally agree. So then we get into a crazy Spidey Doc Ock fight. I, I guess it's crazy. I mean, we've seen a million fights. It's just that the emotions behind it that, that we know are behind it make it crazy. Yeah, there's a couple moments that happen a lot where Spider-Man sort of thinks to himself that Doc Ock's really powerful and that he has to keep moving and has to keep out of reach of these arms. But there's also all these moments of Doc Ock going, well, I'm not winning this. Page 17 is such a great, uh, is like the, is like the peak of the whole issue for me because like usually Spidey has some measure of fear or hesitancy and he has none of it here. Like he is so focused, um, like the panel two where he just like rips the floor up underneath Doc Ock and Doc Ock goes tumbling. And then panel three, he's like shattering a stone column with his feet. And then he's, and maybe panel four is the best one half in shadow with a stone column over his head that he's about to throw at Doc Ock. I mean, it looks like he's not even worried about keeping him alive. For sure he's not. He would kill Doc Ock in this moment. It's a two and a half page fight, which is maybe the quickest Doc Ock Spider-Man fight. And Doc Ock is leaving. Yeah, Doc, Ock, Doc Ock's running away. He's like, I'm um, out of here. Panel four has some of my favorite dialogue in all of Stan Lee, Steve Ditko fights. It's uh, in, in, in non-ironic, like, earnest dialogue is where Doc Ock thinks there's no way to fight him, no way to stop him. He's like a raging human dreadnought. I've got to escape. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love the phrase raging human dreadnought. Um, that's, that's kind of, that's the kind of purple prose I love from Stan Lee. Uh, and he throws that column right at him. Like he's trying to kill him, or at least he's not worried about not killing him. Yeah. And, and but this column happens to knock down a, an important piece of support and all of uh, Doc Ock's important machinery from the level above starts toppling into this room. Yeah, Spidey's like collapsing the room in on himself. He's like Samson breaking the stone pillars and bringing the house down on himself. Uh, so he's screwed up, though, because he didn't mean to do that. So now all this heavy equipment is falling on Spider-Man. 
and yeah, and Doc Ock. Uh, Doc Ock isn't hit by it, but Doc Ock is nervous he's going to be. But it does land and it pins Spider Man. A piece of machinery pins Spider Man temporarily. His legs, yeah, his the his bot, the bottom half of Spider Man is totally covered by a pile of machinery. He's he doesn't he sees that he senses that no bones are broken, so he starts to like wiggle his way out. But as he does, another even more enormous. Um, metal contraption thingy comes like sliding down on top of him. Yeah, Spider-Man headed, uh, thinks to himself headed. that it must outweigh a locomotive and it slowly just sort of creeps down, pushing yep. further and further down on top of Spider-Man, basically going to squish him. He's going to crush him and he's trying to slow it down with his webbing and he can't do it. He's pinned so he can't get out to like catch it or stop it. He, as it just as it's about to strike him, he sort of wriggles into a little gap uh, and so he avoids being pulverized by it, but uh, we're left with him trapped under just an enormous machine. Yeah. Uh, he's pinned, like his two arms are coming out. You can see his head. You can't see oh the rest God. of his body. And this machine goes off panel. You can't see how big it is. It feels it's panel four of page nine, super heavy. <laughs> and and I've seen this this panel, uh, panel four of page nineteen. I've seen it drawn in tribute. Uh, I can think of at least three times. One of them is an Eleven Rockets comic. One is in the Thor, the Frog Thor issue <laughs> uh, of the mid '80s with Walt Simonson. Uh, I said three. I can only think of two. But like this is sort of a weirdly famous. Yeah, it was also homage in an episode of Batman Bond, uh, where a big machinery like this uh, falls on him in a very similar fashion. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, it is um, definitely a thing that people. It's it's part of and it a little bit is sort of homaged in the homecoming movie. The end yeah, of that where movie, he's trapped there with trapped the vulture under a the piece end. of building. It's not quite. I mean, I I even, I even think Amazing or Spider Man Two with Doc Ock and uh, Tobey Maguire. Uh, he's sort of trapped under a big thing. Yeah, anytime he's trapped under a big uh, thing, it, it feels like it is pulling from this at least spiritually. In 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 the. Amazing Spider-Man 2, the Doc Ock one with Tobey Maguire, it does come sliding down on like rails in a similar way. So I'm like, that at least is, they're aware of the, of the parallel yeah. here. Homecoming more hits what okay. happens in the next issue than what happens in this yeah. issue. But. Homecoming is a more direct, direct yeah. homage. Um, so now he's trapped. He, the vial is just out of his reach. And then he notices there's a leak coming from the ceiling because this is an underwater lair. And so the room is about to collapse under the river's weight. Yeah, it's about to flood with water. He's pinned under an enormous piece of machinery. The serum's out of reach, but even if he had it, he can't move. Doc Ock is left. So then we get the final panel of the, the, of the issue. Final page. The big, like, the final yeah. page. Sorry, yeah. The big cliffhanger where basically Ditko just runs down how all the different ways that Spidey is cornered. We have three panels of him trying to move the machinery. It won't budge. Yeah, he even thinks also that points he out hasn't slept for days. So he hasn't slept for days. He's trapped under this big machinery. We cut to a shot of Aunt May dying in a hospital. She's moaning his name. Peter. Yeah, I mean, I just, I love it. I mean, that, that is a melodramatic so, movie moment. Oh, it's, well, I mean, let's keep it going. Like, and then, then we see Connor... Uh, Dr. Kurt Connors with the serum. He's helpless without the MacGuffin 36. And he thinks if it doesn't get here soon, it, will, it doesn't even matter if it doesn't get here soon enough. Like if he takes too long, the serum won't work. Then we cut to the master planner gang all waiting outside the room for him. You know, and they're thinking if he does escape, we're going to beat the crap out of him. Yeah. And then the final panel is again like a better look at how big this machinery is with the room flooding. And Spider-Man thinking to himself, saying out loud, I've failed. Just now when it counted the most, I've failed. And the little MacGuffin 36 in the foreground being covered by the water that's about to yeah. flood the whole The drips are hitting room. the serum directly. <laughs> and then the, the final uh, panel, the final caption here, uh, wherever you go, you gotta read whatever this. you do, whatever befalls this, we I say to you, you must not miss Stanley the well. next. Oh, you want me to do yeah, it as Stan? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to do both panels mm -hmm. then. But behind the bolted door, unsuspected by the mass criminals, Spider-Man fumes in helpless rage as the drops of water fall ever faster, ever larger, faster, larger, faster, larger. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever befalls, this we say to you, you must not miss the next issue of Spider-Man. And now, till that glorious moment, when you next hold, when you hold next month's copy in your eager hands, we wish you all. He web slinging. Wait, he gets a bad ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's already. Right. 
He blew it. He blew it right he at the end. Missed the dismount there. <laughs> but, but. <laughs> but I mean, I am so ready. I remember reading this in Marvel Tales because it came out once a month also. And I was like, oh my God, like this story is incredible. Yeah. I can't, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for the next month. I mean, you know, Marvel Tales is reprinting this story from 1966. I'm reading it in 1983. Whatever was going on in the current Spider-Man issue, you know, Sin Eater yeah. or Hobgoblin or whatever was going on. I'm sure it was good. But I wasn't ready for that. I, this is the one that I couldn't wait to see. I mean, and see. Spider-Man was alive as issues, so you know he's getting out of it, but it doesn't seem to matter. It, does, it still feels like a great... He hasn't had a moment like this where it looks like he's going to die. There's lots of times where you look like he's going to be beaten or unmasked or whatever, but die? This is it. Or the villain's going to get away with it or something. But not only is he... Aunt May's going to die. Yeah, even worse. Like, if Aunt May dies... If Aunt May dies because of him, he's over. Like he is broken as a I guess it's the emotional arc. You know what I mean? Like it if she dies and he catches Doc Ock, Spider-Man's gonna kill himself. Like he's it's over like his life as a human is done. Yeah. I mean a great what if story would be what if Aunt May died at the end of uh I mean he would become the darkest, most broken villain in the Marvel universe. Yeah, be an interesting story to see the, the dark, the dark. Basically, turn. Spider-Man would live, but Peter Parker, as we know him, would be dead. He would drop out of college. Oh yeah, he would just be Spider-Man twenty-four-seven. I mean, he wouldn't even live another three years. He would he would behave in such a self-destructive way. I think he would immediately go out and just snap Doctor Octopus's neck. Like yeah. he would just be he would just be a completely insane person. Um. Anyway, that's our issue. And boy, oh man, I love yeah, it. Yeah, and there's one more issue of this storyline to go, which we think is sort of the yeah, emotional end of Ditko's run, even though there will be five more issues after that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Next issue is the emotional four, four end of Ditko's run. That. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, definitely download next week's episode. If you listen to this one, uh, you'd be a fool yeah. not to. If you're going to uh, stop, at least do one more. Made it this whatever befalls yeah, whatever you, befalls you. Uh, happy web slinging <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um so sh- uh, should we do s- oh uh, awards yes yeah. uh let's do some awards okay uh do you want to go first yeah i guess um i guess my highlight is i have uh, when spider-man we'll do panel do your okay, panel, my panel it's not necessarily the best drawn panel, but it's definitely the most emotional panel for me is uh, page eight panel, one, two, three, four, seven, where he learns that the master planner has the serum. Uh, It is the, it is a huge story point. Everything turns on that moment, right? Up to that moment, he's like, I'm going to save Aunt May, I'm going to save Aunt May, I'm going to save Aunt May. It's like, oh, the villain you've been trying to stop is going to stop you from saving Aunt May. And he's like, oh no, no, that's not happening. Yeah. There are so many panels in this issue that I love. Him smashing the desk. Um, I even love the Connor's lab with all the smoke going I love everywhere. Those panels, those are beautiful. I love uh, the one that the cover's based on. Is a great talked one. Talked about Betty Brant turning uh, and like looking at him like with just venom in her eyes towards him. Yeah. But my choice is page seventeen, panel four. Spidey half in shadow, holding a stone column that he's raging at Doctor Octopus with. Yeah, I think that panel's terrible. Uh, it's poor draftsmanship. <laughs> no, yeah, it's an amazing panel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all good. I mean, I could, I could also do page 19, panel four, you know, where he's trapped under the machine. But I'm I mean, going to do I even like one, panel though. two on page 17 where he's ripping the floor out from under Doc Ock. It's yep. terrifying. Doc Ock looks scared. Yes, it, it's a real good show of how unleashed Spider-Man is. Um, what's your dialogue? Whew. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to say, mine's the one I said before. There's no way to fight him, no way to stop him. He's like a raging human dreadnought. I've got to escape. Yeah. Um, I don't know which what my favorite is. It's probably, I mean, it's probably, I guess, page five, that first line uh, where he sort yeah. of is emotionally talking about, maybe those first yes. three panels are really all is one line. You read a yeah. lion's share of that. But I've always felt I was partly responsible for the death of Uncle Ben because he was killed by a criminal whom I didn't catch. And now Aunt May, the two people I've loved most in the world, who are like my own father and mother to me, yet their love for me, their kindness to me has brought them nothing but tragedy. It's it's the emotional crux 
that fuels this yeah, entire arc. I, I agree. I agree. It is an it is an awesome page in this story. I mean, this is just one of the. But my I, second I favorite just is can't uh, even believe Dr. Connors. I need your help. Do you remember me? That's a <laughs> close runner up. Uh, what is your highlight? Uh, my highlight is I think when he first uh, bursts into the criminals, the first criminals he bursts in on after deciding to find the serum. Yeah, uh, he's like kicking he, like, the, door the door down. down. He just sort of like in four panels, <laughs> just like wrecks an entire criminal operation that is in no way related to the master planner. I love it. Um, like, just imagine yeah, you're like say, sitting uh, around just going, "Oh, we don't have any schemes this week. I wish we could figure it out the master planner sort of doing everything, and we got to figure out some way to like." And then the door smashes, and Spider-Man just beats the crap out of you out of nowhere. Yeah. You'd be like, "We weren't even doing anything." Yeah, I love it so much. I, I think. Um, I think my highlight's going to be, um, I'll say, oh, hold on one second. You can come on in, Mitch. You don't have to, sorry. And you're, you're, high. um, my highlight is, is going to be similar. I'm going to say it's when, uh, when Dr. Octopus decides to escape, to run away. Yeah. Uh, that'll be my highlight. Um, and I guess my low light is sort of what I said is like, I kind of wish they didn't reveal who the master planner was up until Spider-Man re- it finds out. I really don't have a low life, but I'm going to pick the last sentence of that panel that I read out loud because <laughs> happy web slinging <laughs> dropped the it dropped the tone so hard. Yeah, <laughs> happy web slinging is my low yeah. life. <laughs> Your low life's the last three words of the issue. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I'm going to pretend like they're not there. So, um, those are our awards. Now this yeah. issue can finally Should feel we- good about itself. <laughs> Should we do a couple yeah, letters? We've got a ton of email. First of all, so if you uh. If you want to write us, write us at screwitspidey at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at screwitspidey as well. We post a lot of images on Instagram and we repost those on Twitter or we link to those on Twitter. Uh, we try to respond to stuff on all those forms. Uh, uh, we've gotten a ton of emails since the last time we recorded, maybe like 15 or 16 emails. We got two today. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, in fact, we're not going to be able to answer most of them today, but we will get to them in the later. Do this, these, this episode and next episode are just... We've got too much to talk about, but we'll definitely get to most, if not all of these emails. So if you wrote us and we haven't responded to it yet, uh, we will. Don't worry. Uh, if you haven't written to us, please do. We've gotten some emails, which I'm not going to get into now, that I was just telling you about before we recorded, Will, where um, a few issues ago, you talked about how you, because of an image of Spider-Man with a smile, you credited mm-hmm. Steve Ditko with the creation of Venom. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, and we were trying to think of which creations we could not give Ditko credit to. I suggested the Kingpin. You dismissed the Kingpin as a Daredevil creation. <laughs> that's right. And uh, we've had some people email in with other major Spider Man characters that were not created by Steve Ditko. I'd love to know more of those. But even better is a few people trying to take away uh, characters that Ditko did not create. And give credit to Ditko. Somehow find a reason why Ditko created those characters. <laughs> I think that's a fun so game So if you can think of some reason why uh, the Kingpin, the Rhino, uh, any, like, like we would say Hobgoblin sort of is a Ditko creation because he's based off of based green on the Green Goblin. Goblin. A Ditko creation. Like we're looking for those sorts of threads. So yeah. you can find some way to do that for any creation. <laughs> That Ditko yeah. did not have a handle in, in Spider-Man Mythos. Uh, we'd love to hear it. Instead of a no prize, we'll give you a co-prize for Ditko prize. Yeah, KO prize. There you go. Uh, yeah. But we'll get into those in a couple episodes. Uh, I want to read just a few good ones here. Um, this is not it. Uh, give me one second to find it. Um, great. This is from uh, uh, somebody named John. He's a a listener to our podcast. He's catching up on past episodes. He's currently only on this email on issue 19, uh, whatever episode that would be for us, but issue 19 of Amazing Spider-Man. And in that issue was one of the times we mentioned, or or up to that point, we had mentioned at some point that every time Aunt May gets sick, it sort of takes us back to our mom's death. Because our mom died when we were very young. I was 12 and you were 16, 17. Uh, I was uh, 16. Yeah. So, and whenever Aunt May gets sick, we sort of feel a little bit, it really hits us, this idea of being a child and this person that's very important to you is on the death door. And if there was something you could do about it, what would you do? Um, And this guy writes, when I was a kid, my parents got pretty sick and my dad didn't make it. That's something powerful about viewing Spider-Man through that lens. 
Without Uncle Ben's death, there is no Spider-Man. The wonderful and the tragic are intertwined with and dependent upon one another. Viewing superheroes through their relationships they have with deep personal tragedy, we understand that all the best things about us are forged in the fires of the worst things that happen to us. The superhero and supervillain stories help us stomach our most terrible experiences because they tell us what distinguishes a hero from a villain is not the things that happen to us, but the things we choose to become in response to them. And that's a uh, really well written. I love it. I love um, it. And uh, I love that we inspire that even a tiny bit out of John to write that. Uh, and that yeah. Spider Man inspires that out of him. Um, and it definitely. I, I couldn't have said it. Couldn't have said it better. And I think many of the same things when I read these stories. Yeah, definitely. Anytime his loved ones are in danger, you. I, I can't help but feel that. Yep. Um, and then real quick, a couple re- very recent emails. These are in response to our last episode. Uh, we'll get to the older emails in a later episode. But someone uh, talked about how he was. He just read part one of the Master Planner Saga. Mm-hmm. And he says, we're making him want to read it. Our passion and enthusiasm are infectious. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, a number of people have said similar things. One person wrote us and said they didn't like it. Oh, okay. This is Keith. That's- uh he said, uh, so he signed up for Comicsology Unlimited so that he could read some of these issues. Okay. Uh, and uh, issue 31 was not in the Unlimited thing, so he had to buy it separately, but he did. Oh. Uh, and he was disappointed in the issue. Mm. Uh, mm. And he, uh, he's glad he talked about how for the uninitiated, this issue was all set up and no real adventure. He's a little worried when he finished 31 and thought, this is the first third of the greatest Spider-Man story ever. Yeah. Uh, He'd still trust us. He's going to read the next two issues. (laughs) Um, I've enjoyed reading these early issues. It's great listening to you guys reminisce, re-explore them. So Does it say say why he doesn't like it or anything? I think because it's all set up. I think because there's no real adventure. I mean, I I could totally understand that. And just believe it or not, for all all the... I'm always, I'm curious to hear anybody's honest reaction, even if it's... Totally different than it's hard for thought. us to separate ourselves from that story now. Uh, for me, especially because I read all three in a row the first time. You were reading the month, the month at least, but I think I didn't read them until you said, "Read these three. Yeah. Um, so when I read them, I had I went to the right to the next issue, so it read like one long issue to me. Yeah. Um, and even when I reread them, I always forget that in that first issue, he doesn't go on a rampage yet. He doesn't even know they haven't stolen. Uh, Master Planner hasn't gotten that serum. I always imagine that gets stolen in the first part. Yeah, that's right. But, it's this. Uh, but yeah, so uh, he's still reading. I'm curious what he's going to, Keith, please write in and yeah. let us know what you thought of part two. Yeah, let us know what you thought. I mean, even if, honestly, even if you, even if the whole thing is disappointing, I, I am curious to yeah, hear that. Yeah, I feel bad that we got I you to buy bad. it. I mean, we're not trying to lie to anybody. Yeah, we love um, it genuinely. It, um, it, it could be, it could be that like, you know, comics have changed a lot. And so it's kind of, it's kind of like watching the best movie of 1945 or something. Yeah. Uh, it's still going to be a good movie, but there'll be a lot of it that doesn't hold up because you don't have the context of all the other movies around it or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and he asked some other things that I'll get into in another episode. I just wanted to kind of touch on the master planner questions. But those are the emails I'm going to hit today. Uh, but please keep writing us at screwitspidey at gmail.com, particularly if you can you have a steal second one about? Did you have a second one about the master planner? Uh, those were the two. The one was just that he, ha- I guess he hasn't read it yet. Okay. Um. Uh, and I've run into a few people who've mentioned that they've just read part one and are really excited to read part two. Um, yeah, I've, I'm open to any and all comments on these. Yeah, I'd love to stories. know what everyone thinks of these uh, as an issue as they read them. Um, but yeah, keep writing us. Let us know what you think of this saga in particular. We'll get to, we'll try to get to all the emails. We'll probably get to them starting in issues 34, 35, and 36. Right, right, right. We'll have time to get to all of these emails. Um do you have time for me to do a quick recommendation? Sure, yeah, let's do it. I want to do what I did last episode and recommend an arc from a, uh, a long run that I read. Okay. Uh, so last week I talked about The Incredible Hulk by Peter David. Yes. So this time I'm going to talk. And The Incredible Hulk was like the first comic I really collected other than uh, Spider-Man, which was sure. the first okay. one I collected was Marvel Team-Up slash Web of Spider-Man. And the next one I collected was The Hulk. Um. So this is a comic, The Flash, which I didn't really start reading until after college. Um, and at that point, there was the Flash TV show in CBS. So the Flash comics right, had with, like a little star on them saying like, you know, read, read the hit television show um, in comic book form. And I was like, you know, I've never read a Flash comic 
yeah, he's always appealed to me in some way. So I started reading it and I loved it. It was written by William Messner Loeb's. Uh, I think the artist was Greg LaRoque at that okay. time. Um, and I went back and like bought every issue that this, that William Messner Loeb's wrote of the flash. Some of my favorite stories, which I've told to will about a lot, like nobody dies, uh, which is a flash story where he jumps out of an airplane. I love nobody dies. Um, to save somebody, he doesn't want anyone to die on his watch. And so he leaps out of an airplane, even though he can't fly to try to figure out some way to save somebody. Um, but this whole story was, is mostly about Wally West, who is the second or not really the second flash, but a, he used to be kid flash. The flash died. So he became the flash. His right. mentor died. So now he's the flash and he's trying to live up to his mentors, uh, image, his mm-hmm. lineage, his, his history. And, He's not nearly as fast as uh, Barry Allen, the flash. Okay. He, people sort of doubt him. He doesn't take it as seriously. He doesn't, he's just been the superhero his whole life. He doesn't really, he, uh, he takes it maybe too lightly for some, uh, but it's, they're great stories. They're really fun looks at how speed works. And they build up to the story where Vandal Savage, who's a villain that I'm not going to get into what his deal is, but he has kidnapped all of the flashes, loved ones, his mom, his best friend, his his girlfriend at the time, um, has captured them all mm-hmm. and then captures the Flash and the Flash wakes up and he's on these platforms that sap his speed and all his loved ones are on either side of this platform. And so he's on this platform. He's a normal person for like two squares of a sidewalk. And Vandal Savage goes, I'm going to shoot at you. If you escape, I'll let you go. If I hit you, you die. If you try to do anything like run the other way or, or like run left or right, I will shoot your loved ones instead. So your only option is to try to run straight at me, get two squares in normal speed, and then you'll, your speed will kick back in and you'll be, you'll be able to stop me easily. Uh, and basically the Flash has to outrun a bullet as a normal human. And uh, he doesn't, and it's a great story. Uh, it's like a two or three issue arc, basically. That was sort of the a super heroic climax of this run. It goes on a little while longer, but that moment was like, that stood out to me as just like a really cool thing. It's just like, what's the flash like if he can't be fast? Now what? That's everything. Uh, That's all he's got. Yeah. Uh, and it was a really cool story in a, uh, uh, in a run that still, I think back very fondly to that entire run. I haven't reread it in a while, uh, but it's, it's a seminal run in my comic collecting life. Will, William Esther Lives is a writer that I've, I, I heard about from Kevin and that, um, but that once Kevin sort of like turned me on to how good he was, I, he, he, everything this guy did was great. Like he's one of these people that he just makes good stuff all the time. He's very underrated. Uh, he has a very sad life uh, of recently that I don't want to necessarily get into, but if you Google him, bad things have happened to this guy. Um, He's had medical problems and uh, he was homeless for a while. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's brutally sad, but he's wrote some comics that were really, I've donated to some GoFundMes in his name just because these comics meant so much to me. He wrote a great yeah. run on Dr. Fate. I really loved. Um, he wrote uh, uh, Epicurus the Sage with Sam Keith of the Max. Uh, I think he even maybe dialogued the early issues of the Max before Sam Keith felt confident enough to do it himself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, the guy wrote some really, really, really good stuff. Yeah. He's a, he's a great writer. There's no doubt. Yeah. Um, good recommendation. Yep. Uh, that's all I got. Good job. Um, well, um, I guess we should wrap it up and just say that I hope everybody who's listened to this episode comes back next episode. Um, it's the emotional climax of Ditko's run and I'm super excited to talk about it. Yeah, guys. Happy web slinging. Oh boy! <laughs> uh, that's how you got to end a podcast of, yeah. of this importance. That's right. Uh, um, yeah, but right, see, guys. see us next week for issue we'll thirty-three. One of our yeah, maybe our favorite issue of Spider-Man ever. Yep. Um, good job, well, Kevin. If it wasn't this one, it's the next one. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, good job, Kevin Hines. Good job, Will Hines. Bye, everybody. Bye. Screw it! Screw it! We're just gonna talk about Spider-Man.